Oh, hi everyone, how are you? I am in recovery mode. Um, it is now Sunday, I guess, a Sunday night. I've had my surgery Thursday morning. I guess everything went really well. Um, I don't remember the post-op part, so that's why I say I'm guessing. Um, I was in so much pain when I got out of post-op. I in the first day and stuff, I really regretted having the surgery. Now that I'm three days out, I'm just more frustrated in that I can't do anything. Um, I'm really restless, so I just snuck out of my bed and came over here to my laptop and was gonna start reading a little bit more of the discovery. And I was like, well, I might can just try to record. If I suck, I suck. I won't pop it up, but we'll just try. So I had this master plan of waiting to read every, all the emails I want to respond to and comments for when I was at this time. Well, I didn't realize that I was going to be so um, incapable of doing anything. My, um, I'm very right-sided and the surgery is on my right, si right side. So my splint goes, um, you know, through, so it keeps my, my elbow at like a 30 degree angle. And it goes over my shoulder, over around my neck, around my back. I have a pillow out there and so I can't do anything I've been trying to text with my right but it just hurts too much so I'm going to try and paginate with the um, left hand and do the up and down here and it probably won't be as long because I just don't know that I can do it but the bottom line is, is I'm not having any luck trying to write back to emails so please give me a little bit more time on that if you have sent me an email um, I'll figure it out believe me I'll find a way but right now I can't figure out how to eat or anything I'm just absolutely freaking helpless my husband um, took leave and he's been amazing because I need to have like 10 pillows to position myself at any given time. And, oh, it's just, it just freaking sucks. It just sucks. But I'm glad it's over and I'm on the other side of it now so that um, I can hopefully get to the point of um, getting better at some point. So thank you all for being so patient with me. Thank you all for given me um, advice on how this is and kind of how much it does suck because it does absolutely suck. I've never had a surgery that has made me feel so absolutely thoroughly incapable of doing anything. Um, so with that being said, with that being said here, Let's go back and we're going to go over to where we left off. Watts Discovery part, and this will be part 11. And we'll start on page 288. And we'll see where that takes us. Thanks for listening. Okay, so we come out over here and this is a document called Weld County Regional Communication Center and in this electronic communications report by conversation. So we have um, basically um, weld regional communication. So more back and forth of what they are talking about. And Bollinger says on 8.14 at 11.04, he says, I can take the cold berg now. Okay. And Patterson says, okay, thanks. And then, um, lines oh shit sorry about that guys okay there we go line says good morning all units attached to 295l will be on foot canine track no need for status checks and no need for a clear channel thanks patterson said oh okay thanks and then um gregorian says my hold is up is for a sup Okay, so I think that's my hold is for a supervisor, and then there's um, some other code names or whatever, like, uh, that are in here. Not code names, but maybe names of other officers. And then we go over here to 279. Um, it says, Greeley Weld County Criminal Justice Records, application for a release of criminal justice records. And that's a, for the district attorney, E911 radio traffic request. And the person requesting is Kathy Holscher, H-O-L-S-C-H-E-R. And her agency, 
um, phone extension is 4719. And the case number is stated as 18FE0673. This is for the date of 8-24-18, and this is for Officer Deputy Agency Frederick PD. And looks like they are requesting um, about the incident on 8-13, um, incident 2608046 for a felony. And what it says here is Watts, date of birth 5-16-1985, DA case 18 CR 2003. The comments include initial call came in on 813 and there's attack. There may be subsequent communications in relation to this call. We are requesting any and all of those communications and or calls. Okay. And then it says recordings moved to folder. And then it says it says dispatcher was Crystal Pratt on 83018. And it says um included multiple follow-up calls for radio traffic for the following incidents and agency cases. And then they go through all of these case numbers. Well, my So if you're counting, we are on page 325 of the discovery. Okay. Now this is 326 and we go through here and here is some stuff because collected items, blah, blah, blah. And each of these have digital attachments. So evidence entry recorded interview of Nicole Kessinger. Are all of these things in blue then able to open and export? We could have a gold mine here, folks. Hmm. I'm going to try and chicken peck out something here and put 326 and 281 and see if those are hyperlinks. Because if these are hyperlinks, then we have all of these things we can go through together too. Um, I don't want to mess anything up right now, so I'm going to just kind of scroll through. And if you guys are scrolling through with me, do you guys see this? where it's all these things in blue that look like they're hyperlinks. So they could be all of the embedded interviews and names. Ooh, on. All right, oh, it goes down, right? We'll come back here, oh, and then we have an FBI, unclassified. Well, and we know that, you know, Shanann's mother called in the FBI, so gotta get them in here. So this is unclassified by the FBI. And it is an evidence entry recorded interview of Nicole Kessinger. Oh, okay. So what we just saw there where it says that that's embedded, this must be each of the embedded already in writing. And then they're embedded in the others. Ooh, this is cool. Tip to the Gatorade on that. My throat is just still sore from being intubated. You know, that feeling afterwards where you're like, you know that like something something happened just kind of feel violated let me see here okay so the event title evidence entry recorded interview of Nicole Kessinger drafted by Philip Jones approved by Todd Sensett date 8-20-2018 collected from very special agent Philip Jones and it says the case the, the case ID is 7A TAC DN TAC 297-0827. And it is you says so it says you in parentheses, Christopher Watts, Shanann Watts, etc. All Frederick County missing and abducted mother and children. 
Receipt given? No. Holding office, Denver. Details. Recording interview of Nicole Kessinger. Protect identity on August 15th, 2018. So why is she so protected? Why has it always been to protect her? Why was making her image and everything she said so protected as opposed to investigated? I don't know why somebody that close to what happened needs a protected status, you know, because they really did protect her. And I'm not sure why. So, unclassified. This document contains neither recommendations nor conclusion of the FBI. It is the property of the FBI and is loaned to your agency. It and its contents are... Sorry, my seat. See, I keep hitting the other button with them. So, I'm trying to do that left. Sorry. It is... Its contents are not to be distributed outside your agency. Okay. So, the FBI... Ronnie Watts, date of birth, redacted, home address, redacted, Spring Lake, North Carolina, 28390, cellular number 910, TAC, blocked off, was interviewed at the Frederick Police Department. After being advised of the identity of the interviewing agent and the nature of the interview, Watts provided the following information. Note, the below is an interview summary. It is not intended to be a verbatim account and does not memorialize all statements made during the interview. Communications by the parties in the interview were electronically recorded. The recording captures the actual words spoken. The recording of this interview is maintained within the Frederick Police Department case file. Sip of the key. I am the one-armed woman. Okay. Watts was notified by his son, Christopher Watts, Chris, on Monday, 0813 of 2018, that Chris's wife and two young daughters were missing. Chris was unsure as to where they were, where they went, or where they're currently located. Chris advised Watts that his wife did not take her cellular telephone, purse, and vehicle. Chris thought that his wife and children may have went to stay with a friend, but Chris didn't, did not tell Watts who that friend was. Sorry, I just burped. Chris advised Watts that he and his wife had a separation discussion prior to Chris going to work on Monday. Watts arrived to assist Chris in his search for his wife and children on Wednesday, 8-15, 2018. Watts arrived at DIA around 9-15, to 20 a.m. and was picked up by Chris. So Denver International Airport at approximately um, 9.15 9.15 or 9.20 a.m. Watts advised that Chris and his wife Shannon had met in North Carolina and were married there. They moved to Colorado They moved to Colorado so she could get out of there because she was getting served with papers for embezzlement. But anyway, sorry. Oh, ouch, ouch. Okay, there we go. Don't move the shoulder again. Don't do it. Oh, Mart. All right. <sighs> they moved to Colorado approximately seven or eight years ago. Chris and Shanann have two daughters, Bella and Cece, as well as a baby on the way. Shanann recently visited North Carolina with her children for approximately six weeks to see family and friends. Chris met them for approximately one week during the last portion of the visit. Shanann stayed with Watts and his wife 
okay, they must be um, referring to Ronnie because it says like this. Shanann stayed with Watts, Watts in capital, and his wife at their residence during the first part of the visit. During the second part, during the second, during the second week, Shanann and Watts' wife had a blowout and Shanann left with her children to stay at her parents' house. Watts described the argument between Shanann and his wife as a disagreement over dealing with the children. After Shanann and the children left Watts' residence, Watts did not see them again for the remainder of their trip. So when she went out, she wasn't even planning to spend the initial time with his parents, with her parents, it sounds like, but they're so close. You know, those ruse just want to act like, you know, they're just so, 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 so close. So she went out to stay at the Watts house and then the blowout happened, argument over the children, which we know what that was. Um, that was nut cake. That was nap cake. And then she went to her parents, which is interesting. Because the narrative would have you believe the opposite. Okay. Or discovery page 329. Let's see. Watts advised that Shanann went back to Colorado after the North Carolina visit for a day or two and then went on a business trip to Arizona for a conference. Because, you know, that's what you do when you're so sick and, and you, you know, you're throwing up. And, and, uh -huh. Shanann works for Lavelle Thrive Nutrition as a salesperson. <clears throat> Shanann went on the business trip with her friend, Nicole, who talked. Shanann is very active online and has a lot of Facebook friends. Watts is unaware of any suspicious activity involving Shanann. Watts advised that Chris has one sister, Jane, who lives in North Carolina. Chris works for Anadarko Petroleum as an oil and gas worker. Watts is unaware of any financial difficulties that Chris and Shanann were facing. Oh no, Papa Ronnie didn't know any of this. Well, Chris didn't know any of it. Poor Papa Ronnie. Oh man, I wonder if Papa Ronnie now knows the extent of it. I hope so. Um, oh, can you imagine? Just as a side note, you know, she goes out there to stay, and she gets in these little petty arguments with Cindy. You know. Meanwhile, she's a pathological liar that hasn't been making the house payment that has drove them back into extreme debt and she's going around there like she's some kind of well queen of the dirty south and expects everybody just to freaking bow down and never question her insane rituals with the children and when they do this happens and she's more than likely pregnant with another man and she goes in their house and acts like this just disgusting just just absolutely disgusting well here we go here we go and here's what papa ronnie does know papa ronnie does apparently know a couple of things here we go watts described shannon as controlling boom good boy ronnie controlling narcissistic bada boom ronnie good and possibly bipolar yeah i think so Watts has not witnessed any verbal or physical altercations between Chris and Shanann. Watts is unaware of any threats between, made between Chris and Shanann. Watts feels that most of the issues between Shanann and Chris are caused by Shanann. Watts advised that Shanann has some physical health problems, including lupus and spine issues. Watts is unaware of Shanann receiving any counseling or psychological treatment. Watts believes that Chris typically leaves for work around 5 to 5.30 in the morning and returns home around 4 and 5 p.m. Chris usually picks up the kids from daycare on his way home. Shanann typically drops the kids off at daycare in the morning. Watts believes that, the, that Chris and Shanann's house is currently for sale 
and that they have talked about getting separated. Huh, how funny how that didn't make the headlines. That was me, not this. <laughs> I keep digressing, I'm sorry. Um, because look at this here, because this is Papa Ronnie without knowing anything else. And he says straight up, listen to what Papa Ronnie says. He says that he believes Chris and Shanann's house is currently for sale and that they have talked about getting separated. This is stated so many different times, so many different ways, but it made better headlines to sell to make it seem like they were this happily married all white family that never had any issues. Well, the truth is something so much more sinister and wow. Wow, Papa Ronnie. Papa Ronnie speaks the truth. I think Papa Ronnie's a nice person. I think that he's just a quintessential grandfather man. In truth, though, I do think that uh, Frankie Sr. Um, was a good grandpa to the girls in person. I didn't see him causing the kind of problems that... Um, Shanann's mother did. I feel that both grandfathers were good to the girls and that is at least some I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just feel so sorry for the way the girls' lives were in total and I just I don't ever see them really being happy unless it was, you know, a forced smile. So just to know that they're they were loved unconditionally, I think, by their grandfathers means a lot to me. And I think Cindy Watts loved them as well. Um, so they got love from the Watts. Chris and Shanann have no other relatives who reside in Colorado. Watts was unsure why Chris and Shanann moved to Colorado from North Carolina. Oh, Papa Ronnie, it's because she had to get the hell out of town because she was going to get served with papers because she was accused, allegedly, of embezzling money, she had to get out of town. Watts does not know where Shanann or her children may have gone. Watts could not provide any additional details regarding their location. Watts is very cooperative and amenable to future contract contact. You know, he's a nice guy, isn't he? Okay, oh shit, now handwriting. So discovery page 330. And then, so this is just kind of the, where the officer was writing in handwriting what was just typed up. Because uh, we can see there's no other um, relatives in Colorado. Um, I can't see what, I don't know what that says. In-laws in Colorado, uh, Ronnie Watts, 815, 18 Springfield. So, and then um, says Jamie, Five sixteen eighty five. This says son. Chris called him four thirty to five p.m. Ah, uh, gosh. Ah, uh, four thirty to five p.m. appears something upper wife blah 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 uncle, sorry blah blah blah. blah. Separated discussion discussion of separation. Seven or eight years in North Carolina, couple weeks prior, six weeks North Carolina, over something moved, blah, 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 Bella and Cece, Shanann and kids. One in two days, then had to go to Arizona. Not aware of her, blah, 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 and six weeks. Um, house for sale, question mark, separation mark, lupus, unconfirmed, no counseling, no psych. I really can't tell. Then discovery page 331. 
um, the FBI. So we've got the FBI here um, doing these interviews. And um, so it's their handwriting and then it's typed up, thank God, because I can see some of the same words. I just don't want to put words out there that are not ones I can totally decipher because we're trying to get facts here. And, um, and I keep blabbing off my personal opinions, which is not helping anything, but I watts out. It's some kind of a syndrome, I swear. I get, I got watts syndrome. And when I try to talk straight about what is here, I just get all bumbled and, you know, where the one guy who came into this onto Watts Island a few weeks ago, maybe maybe two months ago now, maybe about months, um, and he looked like a really good psychologist, kind of trying to psychoanalyze everything, right? And I do believe he has a degree in psychology. Well, he was where many of us were, in where we thought that, oh wow, she's so popular because look at all these friends. But then, as we've seen, these weren't friends; these were yes people these were people on a team and whatnot and you look at who came to the actual interviews and they're people who have not known her long there's no lifelong friends there's not for a person who acts as popular as she was acting and wanting others to believe she was that popular it doesn't add up so it's it's so weird because she looks really popular, but the truth is that nobody really knew this woman. I mean, she had each person in her life aware of certain aspects of her. Each person acted almost like a cabinet or a closet for certain lies. And when they were done and they had to go back to their own lives, then she'd go to the next person, the next cabinet of lies. She used each person as a vault as an echo chamber so that they would sit there and say oh yes 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 and the second that they started to question her or say that's not right then that door was closed forever those aren't friendships those are false connections i mean you can have an incel i know that an incel you know is a newer word um as we talk about some of the higher profile crimes where they've been male dominated they've been incels incel is a word for um, a man who's involuntarily celibate it means that he can't get a woman and so he's become okay with that decision and is in a network online with other men who are involuntarily celibate and by definition they are angry they um are not cheery people. They are very, very um, drab and dry, but they have a network, so they know each other online. So you could say, based on that, that, oh, they're very popular. But when you think of an incel, you know who we're talking about. We're talking about that man who's angry that he can't get a woman who's a misogynist who has been implicated in crimes, right? So you look at a person like Shanann and oh, she has a lot of Facebook friends. So then when somebody who doesn't understand the, the surface that we've seen when we scratch the surface, that these aren't actual friends, these are acquaintances, these are convenient uh, contacts. It's confusing because people think, oh, she's popular, but no, she's not. And that is a huge problem in the way that um, she would be psychoanalyzed, as was attempted, it seems, um, because she was actually a very lonely person. Uh, because if one person knew everything she was doing, they would have had to have stopped her. They would have had to have reported her to the authorities. Um, the child abuse and they would have had to have let Chris know because they were going to be homeless. I mean, you cannot have a conscience and know that a man is getting up and working every day hard and that his wife is not making the house payment. You can't, you can't let that go. You just, I mean, I understand that some people did let it go, but how? I, I just think it's cruel. And he was, you know, 
Christopher was doing everything he could to, you know, provide and keep them at an even keel based on the budget for after the last time they claimed bankruptcy. But she was doing everything she could to get herself paid and take herself on vacations and go places with herself and herself. And it didn't include the family. It didn't include the girl's happiness. It didn't include anybody's happiness but hers. And even she couldn't make her own self happy. She was trying to. She was chasing it, but she wasn't ever hitting it. And that's what deception does. Okay, I'll shut up now. All right, so. All these straps on this sling are killing me. John Tinkwiller. Funkwiller, Tinkwiller. Telephone number, redacted. Was interviewed at his place of employment. It's Anadarko Petroleum Corporation. 501 North Division Boulevard, Platteville, Colorado. Agent Greg, Greg Zentmer, Colorado Bureau of Inde Investigation, was also present during the course of the interview. After being advised the identities of the interviewing agencies and the nature of the interview, Tuck Willer, sorry guys, it's scanned in and it's really blurry. Tuck Willer provided the following information. Tuck Willer is the supervisor of Anna Darko's operations center. He is familiar with Chris Watts, but Tuck Willer recommended interviewing agents speak with Watts' supervisor, Luke Eppel, and other coworkers for additional information regarding Watts. Anna Darko maintains approximately 1,200 to 1,500 batteries or oil production sites in a, ge in a geographical area generally confined constrained that's a weird word constrained generally constrained by Greeley to the north interstate 470 to the south interstate 76 to the east and interstate 25 to the west these sites vary between exploration and production, P and P, and midstream. Midstream sites are manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. E and P sites are further divided into vertical and horizontal sites. Vertical sites are the older type of the two, and Watts worked as a field supervisor at a vertical site. There's a couple of spelling things in here too, so I'm trying to go there because it says at a vertical site. So there's just a couple of little typos trying to make it make sense. Make it make sense. Anna Darko has approximately 14, and this, I'm sorry. Anna Darko has approximately 400 cameras, cameras in service, of which approximately 200 are located in the parking lot and vicinity immediately around Anna Darko's Platteville office. The remaining cameras are in place at major batteries. Anna Darko has had issues with individuals entering oil production sites and committing lewd or destructive acts. Hmm. So Anna Darko placed a small number of game cameras at some sites, perhaps five to 10. These cameras are not serviced. Batteries are not typically access controlled beyond a simple secured gates. See, it says, like I say, these words are not formed right because, okay, let me try it one more time. Batteries are not typically access controlled beyond simple secured gates. Okay, there we go. These locking mechanisms do not keep a log, keep of, keep a log of access times or persons accessing the sites. Some newer facilities may monitor access in and out and have cameras, but most sites do not maintain records of entry or exit of personnel. We've all kind of asked that, like why was there no cameras? And who's going into those areas doing what kind of lewd stuff? So we're still interviewing, um, interview of John Tuckwiller. Vertical sites are generally managed by exception. Operators maintaining vertical sites are given a certain number of wells to maintain. And these sites are typically seen approximately every few days to once a week in order to ensure proper function. 
operators work different types of shifts. Some may work seven days on and seven days off, or eight days on and six days off. A typical work day may be 10 hours or more. Anadarko work trucks are equipped with GPS monitoring. Tuckler was not sure of the frequency in which the GPS updates in relation to a vehicle's location, but he believed it may be it may update one to ten minutes. Okay, every one to ten minutes. Anadarko uses a service called Geotab. This service tracks information to include, but not limited to, seatbelt use, hard acceleration, and deceleration and speed. Work truck use is limited to work-related tasks. Operators also utilize a messaging application called GroupMe to send and receive messages to other work crews in the operations center regarding tasks, locations, and other work-related information. GroupMe is typically accessed by employees' work telephones. Luke Apple is currently Watts' supervisor. I added the word work in one of those sentences, I'm sorry. Okay, so here we are, and the, the handwritten stuff that we just read that was typed out. more of that. Okay. The only thing I see here is on 291 of 1960. It says wife issues with a tag that says 1029. Looks like it says wife issues. And then the next thing says geotab and that's in that handwritten. So let's see if anything says. And then 731 to 81 says something and it says she something. And then it says she, she's held be there backslash can't get ahead of my case something. I don't know. It's on page um, 336 instead of handwriting. And then talked about camera. Could tell Chris was upset. Chad McNeil, one year, walk away. Survey 319. Um, Survey 319. Security alarm on phones, 12 left, blah, 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 something. Called Chris, something. Just more handwriting, chicken scratch. Now, I, I have really bad handwriting, so I'm not dissing anybody. Okay, now let's see if this is all written up and makes sense to what I just saw. Writer, Special Agent S.A. Tori L. Smith with the Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI is Computer Analysis Response Team, CART Tech certified, and is Digital Extraction Technician trained, DEXT trained. Did you have a point? Thank you. Thank you. On 8-15-2018, FBI Supervisory Special Agent SSI SSA Ton Todd Ton Sanset requested writer respond to 2825 Saratoga Trail, Frederick, Colorado, 80530 to assist investigators with the internet service provider ISP router. Writer was advised that the router was a uh, multi gear N900. While responding to the residents, FBI 
FBI computer scientist C.S. Westcott Hyde downloaded a manual for the Netgear N900 from Netgear's website and emailed it to the writer. Emailed it to writer. Writer, W-R-I-T-E-R. It's getting really confusing because they're asking about this and that. You know, talking about things here. So writer, W-R-I-T-E-R. So writer responded to the residents and met S.A. Matthew Saylor with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, CBI. S.A. Saylor directed writer to the location of the Netgear N900. S.A. Saylor advised the homeowner, Chris Watts, provided consent to search the Netgear N900. Ryder took photographs of the Netgear's N900's location and identifying labels on the Netgear 900. N900. Images will be maintained digitally in the IA section of the case files. Ryder logged into the Netgear 9 N900 utilizing the default username password credentials identified in the manual. Now that's a little trick I've heard before. So if you're having a problem with your router or your computer even, if you download, because if you don't have the original stuff, if you go on, online somewhere else, a friend's house, whatever, um, and you download the actual manual, it will then provide you with those default um, credentials to get in. I have heard of this. Um, good to know, good to know, right? So, Ryder logged into the Netgear N900 utilizing the default username and password credentials identified in the manual. Ryder took a screenshot of Ryder's network configuration, which will be maintained digitally in the IA section of the case file. Ryder navigated to various tabs of the administration portal and took screenshots. Images will be maintained digitally in the IA section of the case file. Okay, that makes sense that way. Ryder nav navigated to advanced security schedule and determined that the Netgear N900 had a time zone set, set for GMT, so General Mountain Time, um, TAC 0800, Pacific Time, U.S. and Canada, hyphen, then Tijuana. At the time of the exam, the Netgear N900 was located in Mountain Daylight Time, GMT TAC 600, 0600, writer identified all log times would be offset by two hours. Writer navigated to advanced administration logs and copy past the logs into a text file writer named router hyphen log hyphen zero one. Log will be maintained digitally in the IA section of the case file. Now that that's established, Let's go have some donuts. Okay. Donuts do sound good right now. You know what? Is I'm kind of, because when I was a kid, I really got hooked on maple bars. And they're just they're just plain plain donut with maple on them, okay? Well, now that I live in a different geographical region than what I grow up on or the where I grew up, they call them long johns out here, but they put chocolate on them. And I'm like, can I get a maple bar? And they're like, uh. and then like their version of a maple bar is a cinnamon swirl, like Persian with maple on it. And it's like, no, no, I just want that, that shape with maple on it. Oh, oh, we don't make those. We'll fucking make me one. And then if I do find them and they have like, they'll have them stuffed with like white cream or whatever. It's like, do you guys know what I'm talking about? I'm just getting a freaking plain ass maple bar. So hard to do. When I talk cop talk, I talk donuts. Okay, so here we go. So a lot of this so far is just nothing. There's nothing really interesting in this. I'm sorry, but it's kind of kind of good since I'm kind of still off my game here. Oh, I need another Gatorade. So we are here on... Page 294 of 1960, and we're still in the report date, date 2118. And what we have here is it's another document of the FBI. And its date of entry was 821 2018 
and it goes on to say, Troy, Mc Troy McCoy, sorry, there you go. Skokomi, Skokomi try to stop me from throwing up um, from the uh, anesthesia. And it really dried me out. You guys ever had a scope patch? I usually throw up out of anesthesia, so that's what they said they'd give me this time. And it worked. I didn't throw up. I'm just really, really dry. So, okay, here we go. Troy McCoy, date of birth, redacted. Telephone number, redacted. Address, redacted. Of Greenlee, Colorado, 80634. Was interviewed at his place of employment, Anadarko Petroleum Corporation, 501 North Division Boulevard, Platteville, Colorado. Agent Greg, Greg Seatner. Again, it's, it's really blurry, guys. Sorry. So it's hard for me to see certain names that maybe uh, some similar letters. <laughs> I'm going to say Eatner because that's what it looks like right now. It might be something clearer as it goes. Um, so Greg Eatner is Eatner, whatever, of the Colorado Bureau of Investigation was also present during the course of the interview. After being advised of the identities of the interviewing agents and the nature of the interview, McCoy provided the following information. McCoy is an Anadarko field supervisor, and he has known Christopher Watts for approximately two and a half years. Watts and McCoy have sometimes worked opposite schedules, but they have been on the same work schedule maintaining E-40 oil sites or batteries since approximately October of 2017. McCoy and Watts generally only interact at work, but McCoy met Watts' wife, Shanann Watts, at the 2017 company Christmas party. McCoy was aware that Shanann, was, that Shanann sold Thrive products. Who didn't know that? And McCoy's wife could also become involved with uh, snake oil. Did you guys know that? Did you guys know that Troy McCoy's wife also got involved in selling this shit? Oh my goodness, it just never ends, does it? So, hi. Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, well, you want to sell this with me? Oh, okay, yeah, let's go sell it. Mm. So he drags her to the Christmas party and she does that. Well, there you go. Super seller, such a saleswoman. Anyway. McCoy believed that he had been to Watts' home twice. The most recent occasion was around February 2018. children had played with the Watts daughters, Celeste and Bella. McCoy remarked that one of his children had seen photographs of Celeste and Bella on the news following their disappearance and had asked if Celeste and Bella could come and play. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Oh my God, that's, that's sad. That is so sad. That is so sad. Ever think about how that's affecting the little kids who knew them, you know, and went to school with them? That's so sad. And by school, I'm talking about the daycare. Called the school. McCoy recalled that during his interaction with Shanann, she was often on the telephone speaking with clients. Mm -hmm. McCoy was aware that Shanann had recently spent approximately six weeks in North Carolina and Watts had flown out to visit er in early August. McCoy was also aware that Shanann had recently traveled to Arizona for a work trip and had just returned. Watts had told McCoy about marital problems with Shanann, but he did not elaborate in depth. Watts and Shanann loved their children and McCoy believed they were trying to talk things out. Watts was described as
peaceful and quiet, and McCoy never had the impression that Watts was seeing anyone else. Monday, August 13th, 2018. McCoy and Watts were working on equipment at an oil well called Survey 319 near Roggen, Colorado. McCoy believes he made it to Survey 319 at approximately 8.30 a.m. Chad McNeil and Melissa per Parrish were also assisting. Parrish is relatively new, and she was shadowing Cody Roberts at the time. Roberts had reported an issue with the well the previous Friday, August 10, 2018. So their task at Survey 19 was to correct the problem. The group left Survey 319 at approximately 11 a.m. and traveled to UPRC 10 TAC 29. At some point after arriving at the second site, Watts began receiving notifications that a friend, Nicole, was ringing his home doorbell trying to contact Shanae. Watts spoke with Nicole on the telephone a few times. He walked away from a gas motor when he took these calls, but he was in McCoy's vicinity. Watts left UPRC 1029 soon after taking these calls. I know it sounds like I'm farting, you guys, but I'm not. I promise I would tell you if I did. It's my um, splint against the um, desk. See? Oh, now I can't make the same noise. Now I can't make the same noise, but it's it's my splint. I promise. All right, tell you. Um, so Watts was driving his Anadarko work truck, which is a brown Ford F-250 or similar. Watts' truck has two toolboxes, two tanks, and two other items in the bed. McCoy explained that the beds of their work trucks are generally fully laden, which makes tasks such as hauling an additional air compressor in the field in the bed difficult. The truck is an extended cab, but not a full four-door crew cab. McCoy knows Watts to keep his truck very clean, and he does not believe Watts generally keeps much in the rear seat besides jackets or other clothing. McCoy marked that Watts' home was also very clean when he visited early in the year. I was going to say earlier, it says early in the year. McCoy text messaged Watts later in the day to ask how he was, and McCoy provided verbal consent for interviewing agents to access McCoy's cellular telephone and photograph and video text messages sent between McCoy and Watts. Ryder began photographing messages prior to transitioning to video recording due to the amount of content. The messages for both personal and work telephones are maintained on disks and stored in IA envelopes associated with this document. It should be noted that the text messages to Watts' work telephone were recovered on August 17, 2018 during a follow-up interview with McCoy with interviewing agents. See Colorado Bureau of Investigation reporting for additional information about this follow-up interview. McCoy believes it generally takes about an hour or an hour and 15 minutes to drive to Survey 319 from the Anadarko office. See my back scratcher. Sorry, guys. Big emergency. I gotta find my back scratcher. I can't live without my back scratcher. I was telling you guys the other day I have a back scratcher in my in each vehicle so it's kind of tucked you know in the passenger side so I can grab it if I need to and in my office my nightstand is right I don't know why I get such an itchy back but I have to have a back scratcher it's wooden time at all times 
Google has been so sweet. has been just so sweet and watching me and he's really scared of my squint because it's something new so he's been really gentle with me which has been good because I'm so afraid of him jumping up on me while I'm trying to sleep or I've just got all my 19 pillows pillowed around me oh. Oh. okay sorry about that guys the back itch is just something I cannot deal with so messaged oh there we go to the next page so we're on discovery page 342 if you're following along and we're on page 297 of 1960 if you're following that way so here we go to there are approximately 500 e40 batteries in the area maintained by McCoy's group Wow just take that in for a second. That's me talking here, not in there. Sorry. Um, but just to think that, so McCoy's group with um, Christopher maintain 500 of those. And they're called E40 batteries. I'm assuming that's what those white tanks are called. And what makes me wonder is how did they know which two to look into? Do you guys know the answer? Um... I swear I've not peeked ahead and I'm trying to find everything just by fact, but this one I don't know. But um, the fact that there's 500 out there and those two were the ones, but also those two were the ones that were getting ready to be decommissioned, right? I think. So anyway, there are approximately 500 E40 batteries in the area maintained by McCoy's group. Six or seven of these sites are on or near Survey, Survey Ranch, which is a cattle ranch. Most of these are older sites that will, there we go, that will be eventually plugged and abandoned. These sites are generally not very large and they may contain a couple of tanks, a water pit, and a well. McCoy Watts and their crews are responsible for keeping these wells operating until the wells are shut down. Ha ha! I see. So this was kind of a thing where they were going to be decommissioned. Okay. All right. I get it. Survey 319 specifically has tanks, a plunger lift, and a single separator. The tanks have openings that are approximately 12 inches by 12 inches and a manway cover on the back held by 27 or more bolts. Clean out crew. Not crews. Clean out crew sometimes come and access tanks via this hatch. I swear, they do not write this correctly. I mean, and it makes it difficult to uh, let it stream because there's just so many grammatical errors. Plus you guys would like to think that I'm on a lot of pain meds, right? Well, I'm not, and that's the that's that's another whole story so the way my life goes I'm on no narcotics whatsoever so I am on Flexoril and Tylenol um, I'll, I'll insert this little thing here so long ago and far away um, because of all the problems I have from surviving sepsis and whatnot, um, I was in severe, severe, severe pain. And it was um, chronic regional pain syndrome. So, like, I, you know, you touched me and I would just scream. It got to that point where my, my body was just too out of control in pain. And there were things, you know, that the pain was from, but nothing that could be fixed anymore. There were no more surgeries I could have, per se. And so I was prescribed um, fentanyl patches and Dilaudid, and they didn't touch my pain. Like, I was still in that much pain. So I never took one too many, never miscounted, never had anybody take anything, never got hooked in any way, shape, or form. But I was not getting pain relief, and I had no quality of life. So I looked at how other countries handle pain control, because 
our country was in a war with pain control, you know, um, cutting people off of pain meds that they've been on for years and years. And it was really scary. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do or what somebody was going to tell me was going to be done. So I found that in Canada, they do um, Suboxone for pain management. And so I found a doctor who would do it for me. Um, and I found a facility where I could go and go through rapid detox in one day with Suboxone in induction. And that was um, like six or seven years ago, six or seven. And I had been in bed literally for 10 years prior to that, you know, just in such terrible pain, I couldn't do anything. Could not walk, couldn't do anything. So when I got the Suboxone on board, um, it is dosed differently because addicts are on Suboxone um, because it takes away craving. So theirs is dosed differently. So mine worked amazing. So I was able to get out of bed within like the first three weeks I started walking and walking one mile and up to five miles a day, et cetera, et cetera. Then I, I went back to work full time and um, did pretty good, but I fall a lot because of the nerve damage in my feet. So I really couldn't keep a good job because I fall on the job all the time. But I was able to control my pain to some degree, like 70% of my pain is covered. So I'm not an addict in any way, shape or form. I'm on Suboxone. And a lot of people are on Suboxone now and they're talking about it. Um, some of the groups that talk in the night that just kind of have conversations going on. I know that Flava has mentioned that she is on Suboxone and a lot of people have said that they are as well. So this was going to be my first surgery being on Suboxone and I wasn't sure how that was going to work. And at first they told me they wanted me to totally stop my Suboxone two days before and then have nothing. I'm like, oh yeah, how does that work? No, thank you. So I talked to my prescriber and he's like, yeah, we don't do that anymore because of the suffering that it causes. So what we'll do is we'll, um, you know, have you taper down as much as you possibly can, you, you can, and then we'll give you oxycodone on top of the suboxone so that it will help. And so that was the thing. And before surgery, we talked to the surgeon and everything. My doctor talked to that surgeon. Everything was clear that they were going to prescribe narcotics on top of the suboxone so that even if some of it was blocked, because the suboxone blocks is your pain receptors, that I would have enough pain control because they were prescribing over that amount that they don't normally would. Well, insurance said no. And of course, it's Thursday afternoon. So then you try for the appeal on Friday, no. Insurance says no, why would you want narcotics if you're on a narcotic blocker? So I'm on the same amount of pain meds that I was on prior to surgery. I was not able to get anything extra. It sucks. It's our stupid, stupid system that doesn't listen to what doctors say, what patients need. It's all about what insurance will allow. And they won't allow us to buy the oxycodone separately because you can't pay cash for a controlled substance. Some odd crap. So that's just one more challenge in my life. It just sucks. But I'm getting through it, so I wish I was on some, because I was hoping just to have some final relief, you know, just some relief from pain, just some, some long-term relief. But no, not in the cards. So that's that. If you guys want any more information on that, please feel, or if you have somebody that you want to talk about um, how to do that, please email me because it's really important to me that other people know that Suboxone is an option. And yes, well, I get people who will probably clip this later and show that, oh, I, mu I must be a drug addict because I'm on Suboxone. Nope, never was a drug addict, never took too much. Suboxone is an amazing drug and it's very safe for people who are in chronic pain as it just helps your brain um, heal and, and your body just, your body can come back to life because the pain is blocked out by about 70%. So anyway, I'll get off that soapbox and here we are. Now, this says that the um, man cover was held by 27 or more bolts. Um, I thought that there were other videos that showed that there were much more. And then they had people going through and showing how long it would take to take that off, etc., etc. So to see that it's held on by 27 or more bolts 
is consistent of what we saw in the recovery, but it's an interesting number. Now it says, McCoy was familiar with another associate of Watts, a male name unknown. Watts had introduced this male to running 10 kilometer runs. That's how they wrote it. Watts had introduced this male to running 10 kilometer Watts. Okay. Runs. The unidentified male's wife is also involved in Thrive, which is how McCoy and Watts met him. Well, what a triangle that formed. Isn't that special, all these people selling Thrive? Watts had lost weight over the past year or so, which he attributed to working out and meal preparation. Watts explained he was trying to become healthy. McCoy was not aware of any additional associates, friends, or family, or other either Watts or Shanann. He was not aware of any jealousy issues, enemies, or any other malicious intent towards Watts or Shanann. McCoy provided a map of the Survey Ranch, Survey Ranch and surrounding sites. Ryder photographed this map and these photographs are electronically maintained with this document. And then we go on to his handwriting um, a chicken scratch that equals out to what we just saw or just heard me read. <laughs> I just read. How about that? Um, I do see this name Melissa Parrish in here that I've not seen. I saw that in another typewriting thing. Um, and then this is just more of the messages. So then he must have written um you must have written this and then like uh, you know how like the doctors of the 80s and you'd go and they'd see them in the hall and they'd go and they'd uh have their little digibox and they'd uh be talking to it, their pagers and somebody on the other end would be typing or something or would listen to it later that's what i think is going on here because they write it all up in chicken scratch and then more or less it's written out to some degree where it makes sense but um, there's a lot of triangles here. And not just where I was talking about triangulation, literally this man writes triangles. And I don't know if the triangle is the symbol for Watts or what, but it's a triangle, 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 triangle wanted to, triangles, not them, triangles, blah, blah, blah. And then the next page is the same thing. And it says, it's this Melissa name again, Melissa Parrish. And then it says 730 to 8, 319 near tanks. This is handwritten. And it says, uh, group me, something officer, pretty, mark, always, books, typical, spat, how big hole, floating around, something, McCoy. Or just more handwriting. Now, here we are into page 300 of 1,960. And it is the FBI Supplemental 6 report from Jones P. Report dated 8-21-18, and it is an unclassified document for physical I 1A backslash 1C cover sheet for serial export. And it says it's created from 7A. TAC DN TAC 2970827 package number 1A6, storage location none. Summary is cell phone images. Acquired by Jones Phillip, acquired on 815 of 2018, and it is the attachment of the cell phone images. So what it says here is Luke Eppel, date of birth, redacted, telephone number redacted, was interviewed at his place of employment, Anadarko Petroleum Corporation, 501 North Division Boulevard, Platteville, Colorado. Agent Greg Zentner, Colorado Bureau of Investigation, 
was also present during the course of the interview. After being advised of the identities of the interviewing agents and the nature of the interview, Apple provided the following information. Apple is Chris Watts' direct supervisor, and he has been Chris Watts' supervisor since approximately April 2016. Watts is a field coordinator, so he is Apple's go-to person when maintenance issues arise. Apple tries to get into the oil field as much as possible, and he tends to split his teams at approximately split his time at approximately 60% in the field and 40% in the Anadarko office. Apple is essentially the foreman for Anadarko sites spanning between OS Highway, the US Highway 85, Weld County Road 22, Survey Ranch, and Denver International Airport. Apple described Watts as quiet and a great employee. Watts has never had issues about showing up to work or being on time. So it's saying he's never been late. And it says Watts has never had issues about showing up to work or being on time. Watts' children have had some health issues, but Watts has always called Apple to advise him if he needed to take time off to tend to his children. Watts is an introvert and does not like attention. He does not get excited, but since the disappearance of Watts' family, he has appeared on edge and flustered. Watts told Apple that he had nothing to hide and that he had moved his work truck away from his house in order to protect Anadarko from any media attention. You know, what would they expect him, this is me talking, what would they expect him to be like? It, if, even if he did not have any involvement, and we don't know that he did or did not, but what would you expect him to be? They're saying that ever since his, his you know, kids and wife have been missing, he's appeared on edge and flustered. What? Wouldn't you think, yeah? Yeah, anybody would be? And that he moved his work truck away to protect Anna Darko from any media attention. I mean, that's... He's still, you know, thinking about others. And that's just... The thing is that this man thinks about others. That's not... That's not a sociopath. That's not... He doesn't fit the kind of person who would have pulled this off. Apple does not believe that Watts has any family in Colorado, and Apple is not familiar with any of Watts' friends. Apple believes Watts moved to Colorado because he and Shanann visited on vacation and liked the state. <laughs> Apple is not aware of any grievances against Watts or his family. Apple has no reason to believe anyone would jeopardize the safety of the Watts' family. Oh, Shanann kept her past uh, quiet, didn't she? Watts has scheduled time off between July 31st through August 7th, 2018 in approximately June 2018. This is, what, this is so backwards the way they write this. I'm sorry. It sounds like I'm so mumbled jumbled, but it's just weird the way they wrote it. I'm going to try it one more time. Watts has scheduled time off from July 31st through August 7th, 2018 in approximately June 2018. Watts returned to work on August 8th and 9th, and he took August 10th off. Took August 10th off. Okay. Why'd he do that? Watts is currently working Monday through Friday shifts, which he has worked for approximately the past year. A typical shift begins at approximately 6 a.m. or 6.30 a.m. and ends at 3 a.m or 3.30 p.m. An employee shift begins when the employee arrives at either the office or the work site, and this is largely based on an honor system. Employees input the time information into an online time card. Watts does not work weekends. Watts does not generally discuss his personal life to include his wife with Apple and he generally does not talk much. Apple and Watts do not associate with each other outside of work. 
Apple considers an employee's personal life to be personal as long as it does not affect work. Performance. Apple was aware that the Watts Apple was aware that Watts was having some marital issues, but he was not aware of specific details. Mm-hmm. Apple's last physically saw Watts on or about Thursday, August 9th, 2018. After Watts' family was reported missing, Watts told Apple that he may be staying with a friend in the event Apple saw unusual activity on his work truck's geotab monitor. Apple explained that Watts was aware that his truck had GPS monitoring and was tracked by Anadarko. Work trucks can be used for minor deviations to and from work, and Watts told Apple that he would not be staying too far from his home address. Hey, here's another thing this is Tabitha doing off the cuff. He knows that there's a GPS tracker on everything, so if he did this, he's not stupid. He knows that there's a GPS tracker on everywhere he goes. He's conscientious enough that he called to say, hey, if you see this there, that's because I've been in the Night of the Friends. That means that he, when he went and saw um, NK, he probably was very careful as well. Didn't take his work truck. But it's not like, oh, surprise, you know, check his GPS. Apple explained that the GeoTab pulls location data approximately every 5 to 100 seconds. GeoTab documents other information such as when the vehicle is turned off and on, and Anadarko switched to GeoTab from another provider in approximately May or June of 2018. On Monday, August 13, 2018, Watts went directly from his home to Survey Ranch 319 with follow-up work at Union Pacific Railroad Company, EPRC 10-TAC-29. Ethel is not sure when Watts actually arrived at Survey 19. Ethel generally arrives at the Anadarko office around 6 or 6.30 a.m. And he saw Chad McNeil and Melissa Parrish at the office at approximately 6.30 a.m. on Monday. Ethel believes that Watts posted on GroupMe that he was at Survey 319. Maintenance at Survey 319 and UPRC 1029 on Monday the 13th was basic routine stuff. Watts and the other operators were troubleshooting troubleshooting a line at Survey 319 which should be easily accomplished. Operators would have would have a checklist to follow that would likely take a couple of hours to complete. This would involve isolating the problematic line in order to repair it. Survey 319 and UPRC 1029 are not monitored by video or any method of access control. Watts left the batteries in the early afternoon. Watts called Ethel and told him something to the effect of, I can't get a hold of Shanann. She's not home. She should be there. Apple heard from Watts via telephone again later Monday. Apple's superintendent had asked Apple how Watts was doing, and Apple requested an update from Watts. Watts explained that his wife's wallet, purse, keys, and identification were at his house. Watts had gone to his neighbor's house and asked to review the neighbor's security camera. Watts noted that he had not seen any activity except when he got into work, into his work truck in the morning and departed for work. Guys, I'm so sorry. This is worded so bad. Watts had discussed returning to work with Apple. Apple had devised a potential plan that would have involved Watts shadowing Apple, but that plan was ultimately denied by Apple's supervisor, Tony Heskey. 
Ethel did not recall Watts saying anything odd following the disappearance of his family. Watts appeared to be flustered during the phone conversations with Ethel following the disappearance. Of course, wouldn't you? You're the expectantest guy, you know? Provided verbal consent for interviewing agents to review and record the content of text messages sent between Ethel and Watts. Those messages are maintained on a disk in 1A envelope associated with this document. And at this point, I think I'm going to stop. Um, I just don't want to push it too much. So we are going to end on discovery page 351. And we got from pages, like I say guys, it sounds like farts, but it's not. 278 to 304. And this is part 11. So we're gonna end this as discovery page 351. We are at part 11 in my series. And we just covered 278 to 304. And I thank you for your patience as I tried to muddle through this. Um, and thank you all for the support and love you give me. I, you know, I um, turn on my phone and I see, and I see a couple of people like, how are you? I'm like, what? People actually care about how I am and everything. You guys are just so kind to me. I'll never be able to feel like I'm worth your time. I just, I, I'm just so grateful every single time that, you know, you guys let me know that you're listening and, and I see that you guys are listening and watching and I, I just, I'm so humbled and I hope that I'll always be worth your time. I'll try to always give you good content. I'm sorry that I kind of suck tonight. Um, I'm just kind of, kind of rusty, you know what I mean? So um, I hope that you're still getting your um, home all ready for Christmas and that um, you're remembering the reason for the season and that your nostalgia, the good parts of the nostalgia are stronger than the sadder parts of the nostalgia. Mine are, mine are getting better, mine are getting better and um, I'm starting to not be so sad about some of the things that make the season sad. and getting more just kind of okay into the season um, but now I don't want the season part to end you know because it's just kind of always magical and people are a little nicer to each other and stuff so I hope you're well um I did put up my Christmas tree on my Instagram so if you look at Tabitha Jane zero on Instagram you'll see it some of you guys have already seen it and um and then when you add yourself to mine, I'll look at your profile so I can see your Christmas trees too. Okay? All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.